Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Peter Raklius, and I'm an emergency department physician here in Toronto at the Scarborough Health Network. I'm also a lecturer at the University of Toronto Department of Family and Community Medicine. I'm delighted to be your moderator for what I know will be a very useful and interesting session today. Our webinar topic was independently conceived by our scientific planning committee, which includes Drs. Eddie Lang, Kirat Freewall, Rob Stenstrom, and myself. My disclosures are as follows, and the other committee members also had no conflicts of interest to declare. The program received financial support in the form uh, of an education grant from Merck Canada, Inc. And all efforts were made to mitigate any potential biases and comply with both the CFPC and Royal College accreditation requirements. So let's start with a little background uh, on this webinar's development. Uh, when we initially settled on this topic, it was because this is an area that was fraught with diagnostic uncertainty and potential for errors. Um, it is particularly timely as COVID-19 pneumonitis can mimic pneumonitis seen with checkpoint inhibitor therapy, raising the stakes that patients presenting with complications from their immunotherapy um, not be misdiagnosed and hence mistreated. This requires an understanding that the adverse events seen with these agents differ from those seen with traditional chemotherapy. Um, there is a need for practical tools to help us emerge department physicians quickly recognize all these agents in this class, diagnose and treat using algorithms and care plans, and recognize when, when to involve the medical oncologist. Um, our learning objectives include identifying the commonly used immune checkpoint inhibitors and some of the basic pathophysiology, recognize and diagnose common and rare presentations of checkpoint inhibitor toxicity, uh, differentiate toxicity-related pneumonitis from COVID-19 pneumonitis, recognize when steroid treatment is appropriate, um, and implement the use of the diagnostic and treatment algorithms as well as patient care plans in the ED setting. Now, to increase the interactivity of the session, we encourage you to use the chat feature to submit your questions, uh, and we'll try to address as many of those as we can. I'll do my best to keep up during the chat, uh, during the webinar. We'll also be doing some audience polling throughout the webinar, and for that, you'll need to access uh, the Mentimeter website, which you can see here on the slide. Uh, you can either use the uh, enter the code, or you can uh, scan the QR code and get yourself set up right now. Uh, you'll be prompted to enter the code when you log in, um, and as the questions come up, um, you'll be able to uh, plug in your um, your answers. Um, so let's get let's actually try this um, to get everyone warmed up. Here's the first polling question to learn a little bit more about today's audience. So please go ahead, enter your code, um, and answer the following question um, about your practice setting. So. What best describes your practice setting? Um, are you A, from an urban tertiary setting? Are you B, from an urban community setting? C, rural community? Uh, or D, a remote community? Um, let's see where our audience is from today. Let's have a look here. So you can see some of the responses already coming in. Oh, you guys are doing excellent. All right, so we got a good representation um, from a rural community. Wow, um, urban tertiary and urban community. Uh, anybody in a remote community? Let's see. All right, give it a few more seconds. That's awesome. Thank you guys all for contributing. And we'll be doing this throughout the uh, webinar. Um, okay. So, and now without further ado, I'd like to introduce our amazing speaker, Dr. Jose Monzon. Uh, Dr. Monzon is a medical oncologist at the Tom Baker Cancer Center and clinical associate professor for the University of Calgary. Uh, he completed his postgraduate medical oncology residency training at the University of British Columbia and Translational Fellowship Training at the Canadian Cancer Trials Group. Uh, he also uh, has completed a PhD focusing on melanoma genetics at the University of Toronto. Dr. Monzon is currently the TBCC Clinical Research Unit Medical Leader, where he helps facilitate the, con and con uh, the conduct of clinical trials. Um, with the options of clinical trials, patients are provided with the hope of another possible line of treatment uh, while rewarding them uh, with the knowledge that they're improving the care of many others um, through these trials. Dr. Monzon currently 
uh, current research interests include clinical trials in cutaneous and gastrointestinal malignancies. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Manzon uh, to the webinar. Thank you, Peter. You know, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Arachlis and also Dr. Eddie Lang and the sponsors and also the Canadian Association for Emergency Physicians for allowing me to speak today. You know, I'm going to talk about this important topic about immune-related adverse events of immune checkpoint inhibitors. So what does the emergency physician need to know? And, you know, I'm a medical oncologist, as Peter said, at the Tom Baker Cancer Center here in Calgary, and I treat cutaneous and also GI malignancies. And uh, I use a lot of these immune checkpoint inhibitors for the cutaneous malignancies, but the indications are expanding quite broadly. And so I'm almost certain uh, in the emergency department, you will be seeing some of our patients with some of these adverse effects. These are my disclosures, and I'll just pause here so that people can have a look. And then I'll move on. These are the objectives, just as Dr. Arachlis had said, you know, immune checkpoint inhibitors are prolonging lives in cancer. And not only that, it's, they, they have unique properties in the sense that some patients can develop durable responses, even if we stop treatment and people are living years. And I'll give you some examples, especially in the melanoma cohorts. Uh, they are used in a variety of cancers. So it's not just the rare cancers like melanoma, but very, um, common cancers, such as in lung cancer, it is now the standard of care. So as I said, uh, very commonly seen in the emergency department with these adverse events. They have unique side effect profiles, and we label them these immune-related adverse events, in part because the ones that we're going to be talking about in particular are the ones that are related to inadvertent activity of the immune system to uh, normal tissues. You know, the goal of these cancer treatments is to attack cancers, but uh, again, it can cause inadvertent activation towards uh, other uh, normal uh, tissues in the body causing toxicities. The management of the immune-related adverse events require a multidisciplinary approach, early recognition, vigilance, and then also early intervention with corticosteroids typically, and also corticosteroid sparing agents as well. So we know that cancers are immune responsive. It's in part because we've uh, noticed that spontaneous regressions of some cancers have been observed, and we believe that this phenomenon is due to uh, immune recognition of some cancers. Uh, we note that cancers occur more frequently in patients that are immunosuppressed. Also, when uh, tumors are excised from patients and the pathologists look at these tumors, there's actually tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, so white blood cells that recognize these cancers as foreign and are acting on them. Uh, cancers also exhibit cellular properties that can be explained by immune selection. So for instance, they see downregulation of MHC class molecules or upregulation of certain cytokines such as TGF beta. Not only that, there have been dramatic clinical responses that have been demonstrated with immune therapies. You know, I'll just briefly go over this history of cancer immunotherapy. It was again, uh, first described by Verschel, he noted that uh, when patients had their tumors excised, that um, some of them had infiltrates of immune cells. Again, telling us that they're recognized as foreign by our immune system and they can activate our immune system and potentially be destroyed by our immune system. Coley was actually the first one that used immune therapy back over 100 um, years ago uh, with Coley's toxin. And I have a brief slide on this. I'll go over this uh, just very briefly, you know, we use IL-2 initially back in the 80s for melanoma. And then it was in 1985 that we used adoptive cell transfer in cancer and then specifically for melanoma in 2002. Adoptive T-cell transfer, again, is basically where they harvest the fresh biopsy of tumor from a patient. They identify the T-cells identified in that patient and ultimately harvest them outside of the patient in a laboratory. Once those cells are harvested, and injected back into the patient, some patients have a very dramatic and durable response to this treatment. The interesting thing is that only a minority of patients will respond to this type of treatment. But again, because there are these patients that have durable responses lasting years, which is out of keeping of the uh, cancer's uh, sort of natural history, uh, people uh, find that this uh, treatment is, is, is very attractive. Having said that, 
Uh, it was 2010 in melanoma where the first immunotherapy demonstrated a survival benefit with the checkpoint inhibitor ipilimumab. And this is where the new era of immune checkpoint inhibitors started in 2010 and beyond. And it has revolutionized cancer care. And just briefly, you know, I mentioned Coley's toxin as the first immunotherapy. Essentially what he did was he injected streptococcal broth cultures into patients' tumors. And again, this was in the 1800s. And unfortunately, he caused a lot of death from sepsis from this. But there were these rare uh, scenarios and cases where he would see marked tumor regression in a patient that actually survived eight years with metastatic disease. So again, uh, you know, the first clues that cancer responds to immune therapy with um, uh, an infective sort of agent. Now, this brings us to the modern area, era, and I'll just briefly talk about the mechanism of action. But so in the, we have normal mechanisms to turn off our immune system. So in the context of chronic infection or a chronic inflammatory state, once the infection is cleared, we have to have normal mechanisms to turn off our immune system. Unfortunately, cancers hijack these mechanisms to turn off our immune system so that they can hide from our immune system. In the, ter in, in the context of an anti-cancer response, we don't want our immune system turned off. We want our immune system to be turned on and acting towards the cancer. And essentially, these are what these antibodies, CTLA-4 antibodies, and also PD-1 and PDL one inhibitors are designed to do. They basically stop the turning off of our immune system. I won't get into further depth of that, but uh, you know, I, I, I refer you to this New England Journal of Medicine paper that sort of outlined the mechanism of action, but essentially it potentiates the T cell response and activity towards cancer, which sometimes cancers activate to hide from the immune system. Because there have been huge uh, uh, advances in cancer care because of these mechanisms, the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine was won by uh, James P. Allison and Tasuko Honjo, the, the researchers that understood the CTLA-4 pathway and the PD-1 inhibitor pathway and its involvement in cancer uh, immune um, uh, surveillance. So this brings us to some of the unique characteristics that are associated with these immune therapies. The first is, is that these immune checkpoint inhibitors are immune therapies, as I call them, is that they have a response in a variety of cancers. And you can see the variety of New England Journal of Medicine practice changing trials that have been published over the last decade. These cancer treatments are now standard of care, as I said, in melanoma, in non-small cell lung cancer, in some subsets of colorectal cancer and endometrial cancer also in genital urinary cancer, such as renal cell carcinoma and Hodgkin's lymphoma. So a variety of, um, of activities in a variety of cancers. We think that these, these cancers are immunogenic in part because of tumor mutation burden. You know, essentially uh, what this graph dic uh, sort of uh, describes is that the higher these sort of dotted bars go, the higher the mutation burden um, occurs within these tumors. And we think that tumor mutation burden is a predictor of response to immune therapies because essentially these mutations uh, translate into mutated proteins that are recognized as foreign by our immune system. So these foreign proteins or neoantigens are essentially um, uh, not recognized as self by our immune system and can be recognized by our immune system to act, be acted on. And so the higher mutation rate, the higher likelihood you, ha you have to uh, respond to these immune checkpoint inhibitors. And you can see here, I mentioned that it's the standard of care in melanoma, lung, and you know, there is activity seen in bladder cancer. And you can see a variety of cancers that have high mutation burdens. And these are the types of cancers that typically respond to immune therapy. Now, because I treat melanoma, I just wanna to demonstrate to you the magnitude of benefit that we see with melanoma um, immune checkpoint therapy inhibitors. You know, um, essentially these survival curves represent three treatment options. So this is ipilimumab and nivolumab on the top line, uh, nivolumab in the center blue line, 
and then ipilimumab by itself in the bottom line. And this is the four-year survival rate, where the four-year survival with the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab, two immune checkpoint inhibitors, was 53%. Now, if you look at um, the uh, previous standard treatments, uh, the median survival used to only be six months, and the two-year survival was 24%. So the 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 um, survival was quite dismal prior to having these treatments. So we have had huge magnitudes of benefit. The other thing that I'd like to demonstrate is that from these curves is that there's a plateau in the survival curve. And the, the plateau seems to occur at the three year mark where we have data that if you're alive at three years, there are some patients that will likely be alive 10 years later. And this is off the immune checkpoint therapy uh, treatment. So again, you know, um, the, the durability response is quite impressive with these treatments. And we've increased the survival by almost tenfold uh, from what it used to be in met melanoma. So again, the prognosis uh, about a decade ago was quite dismal, but currently it is, uh, it is very attractive and uh, uh, the survival is quite impressive. Now, the other interesting thing is, is that if you develop a complete response, which essentially means that when we scan you, there's no signs of your metastatic disease, complete response is typically a predictor of how durable response is. So essentially, you know, the three-year survival of someone that has a complete response with either dual agent checkpoint inhibitor or single agent checkpoint inhibitor is over 90%. And again, I'll remind you that the vast majority of these people had stopped treatment probably around the two-year mark. So again, a marked uh, durable response off treatment. Now I bring this up for the emergency department group because it can make it a bit difficult, especially when you have patients with advanced cancer coming into toxicity to your emergency department. Um, and you have goals of care discussions with these patients. And it can be quite difficult in the sense that, you know, you have a patient where they're, they're just starting their immune therapy, they've developed a toxicity, but they're quite ill or sick from it. Um, you know, we, I would actually argue that because of the chance of a durable response to treatment, you know, they shouldn't be uh, deemed uh, no code or even uh, comfort measures. We should consider, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, ICU admission and things like that to support these patients during their adverse events, even if they have stage four disease, because there is a chance of these durable responses that we're seeing now with these immune checkpoint inhibitors. The other thing about these checkpoint inhibitors is that you can see some unique response kinetics. So again, similarly, um, this is an interesting case of a patient with melanoma where uh, this is his baseline scan uh, in the top panel. And after four, um, sorry, uh, four months or sorry, tw three months of treatment, he had um, a progress progression of his disease. And this patient was... Um, uh, in one of the first trials over a, about a decade ago with a CTLA-4 inhibitor. Because he had progression of his disease and we had no further treatment at that time, um, he was actually sent to hospice according to uh, the, the treating physician. But what you noticed is that despite stopping the treatment at week 16 and then by week 96, even off treatment, the patient had a dramatic response and actually was discharged from hospice. So apparently this patient is alive 10 years later off treatment without any signs of, your, of any melanoma recurrence. It just speaks to the power of someone's immune system. And now that we understand some of the mechanisms of how cancers hide from the immune system, you know, it just speaks to the, the, the um, advances that we've made in these, uh, our understanding and, and it's translated to these uh, durable responses. So this brings us to our next question. So I'll get you to get your phones out or tablets out and go to the menti.com website and vote. So the question is, which of the following represent the most common errors related to complications of immuno-oncology agents committed in the emergency department? And I'll read out the options here. Not consulting the oncologist on call, failure to initiate broad spectrum antibiotics, not considering an immuno-oncological immuno adverse event for what appears to be an infectious presentation in a patient on active cancer therapies, 
not ordering blood cultures for patients with hypotension, but no fever. And I'll remind you, there's no right answer to this. It's just sort of a consensus question that we're trying to determine the answer to. Yeah, you know what? I to tell you the truth, um, I agree with the responses. It looks like the vast majority have responded not considering an immune-related adverse event and confusing it with maybe an infectious presentation. I think that is the most common uh, thing that I see. I've had a variety of patients where um, we've thought the pneumonitis was heart failure, or alternatively, the diarrhea was chemo-related, and they just got IV fluid. So. You know, I would agree with that. And that's the importance of giving this talk uh, as it educates us to uh, uh, learn about these potential complications. So I'll move on. The next question is, which of the following is our recognized complications of immuno-oncological agents? A, adrenal insufficiency. Two, cerebritis, or sorry, B, cerebritis. C, enteritis. D, dermatitis, E, all of the above. I'll give it a few more seconds to have people vote. Very good, yes, you know what? That's the correct answer. All of the above is the right answer. To tell you the truth, cerebritis is actually a very rare entity, but I have uh, had a colleague experience uh, a patient with this complication. So let's move on to these immune-related adverse events, in particular the recognition and management. And I made this, uh, the rest of the talk, to be more case-based. So let's move on to this portion of the talk. So. You know, essentially, as I said, the, these immune checkpoint inhibitors are designed to stimulate your immune system to attack the cancer. Unfortunately, it can also cause inadvertent attack of normal tissue. So I've seen actually uh, immune-related toxicities related to all of these different organ systems. Fortunately, I've never seen Steven Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis. But, you know, I want you guys to know that it can happen. I've seen definitely the dermatitis and also the vitiligo and alopecia. I've definitely seen the hepatic, uh, sorry, the hepatitis that's autoimmune uh, related. I've also seen the colitis and enterocolitis. I've, the, the range of renal toxicities are from nephritis to nephrotic range proteinuria. And again, I've seen that. I've seen the conjunctivitis and uveitis. There's a, the interesting thing about endocrinopathies, you can see all of these endocrinopathies and I have not listed um, type one diabetes because it's rare, but I do have a case that we're gonna be talking about. Um, so I do want you to know you can develop type one diabetes and it can uh, occur quite early on in treatment. Um, they usually, the vast majority of those uh, type one diabetics that develop that toxicity uh, present with DKA. So again, an important presentation for you guys. Um, the interesting thing about the endocrinopathies is that although the vast majority of these other toxicities are reversible, the endocrinopathies are usually permanent and they're on hormone replacement for the rest of their life. Again, pulmonary no toxicities can be quite common and you can see the pneumonitis. And the interesting thing with neurological toxicities, I've actually seen all of these, myosina gravis, um, demyelinating polyneuropathy, Guillain-Barre. I've also seen a maloradiculopathy. The interesting thing about the neurological toxicity is that they can oftentimes occur with the cardiac toxicity, which is actually not listed here. The cardiac toxicities are typically rare, but the cardiac toxicities oftentimes go hand in hand with the neurological toxicity. So if I see someone with a neurological toxicity, then I oftentimes get a troponin, an EKG, and an echo or a cardiac MRI to rule out myocarditis. And vice versa, if I see a cardiac toxicity, I oftentimes look for a neurological toxicity. And again, I have a case that demonstrates that. So this brings us to some of the data in the emergency department. So 
I pulled up two um, studies, one published in the Annals of Emergency Medicine, published in 2009, and the other in the European Journal of Cancer in 2020. And you can see here that at MD Anderson, they pulled up uh, how many patients actually presented with immune-related adverse events in their emergency department. It was a total of 628 patients, and that was over a five-year period. So um, essentially just over 100 patients uh, per year. So not that much, but you can see in a, uh, an on 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 oncological hospital in Northwest England, over just one year, um, there was over 300 patients. So if you add up 185 plus 115, that's uh, 300 uh, patients in just a one year period that presented with immune related toxicities. I, I don't think it's that uh, MD Anderson sees fewer patients with immune related toxicities. I just think that the indications for these agents are are in the variety of cancers that we're using them now are just increasing. And so that's why we're seeing the number of toxicities increase in these emergency department visits. In these same studies, um, looking at the toxicity. So again, this is at MD Anderson. And then this one was the hospital in England. Colitis was actually the number one um, presentation in the emergency department. So just something to point out. Now, in terms of the diarrhea, you know, again, some patients, they come in, they say they're on treatment, they have cancer, and people think that it's chemotherapy, but, uh, and they get hydration and they're discharged. But it's important to note that steroids is oftentimes a uh, common requirement to treat these patients. And there are some rare complications that can occur, like perforation if the colitis goes untreated. So it's important to recognize that immune checkpoint inhibitors colitis requires some sort of alternate treatment with corticosteroids. The other toxicities I just wanna point out that are usually at the top of the list is the pneumonitis, um, nephritis is up there, um, and also the hepatitis was high in the uh, England population and a bit lower down in the, in the hepatitis population. Now, looking at survival of these patients, and this is again from the MD Anderson cohort, um, they actually wanted to look at all patients and patients with pre-existing autoimmune disease because they're actually at higher risk of toxicity due to these immune checkpoint inhibitors. But the myocarditis people actually had a higher risk of death when they presented to the emergency department with myocarditis. So that's not typically unexpected given that the uh, you know, heart toxicity can result in arrhythmias, but you can see that there's a five-fold increased risk of death and it's like six-fold increased risk of death if you have an autoimmune disease and you present with myocarditis in the emergency department. The other thing that was highlighted is that the pneumonitis also has an almost two-fold increased risk of death. So again, it's important to recognize these things and treat them uh, early. Dr. Manzon, yes. uh, there was a question here in the chat um, about if we had a sense of the denominator, what is the risk of the complications resulting in an ED visit among those being treated? Yeah, you know, I, um, the, the vast majority of people actually um, respond to corticosteroids. And what dictates that, although I can't quote you exact numbers, is actually how early on you treat. And, you know, there's um, certain levels of toxicity that I'm gonna get into with these, with these um, uh, immune-related adverse events. And depending on the severity of the toxicities, when it, uh, um, uh, it suggests the implementation of corticosteroids. And, uh, you know, like I said, the vast majority of people actually have resolution of this. Okay, good. Thank you. And I encourage everybody to keep putting their questions in the chat. Right. Yeah, Perfect. Thank, thank you. you. So let's talk about the pulmonary toxicity. This is the first case I'll present a 43 year old woman with a history of cutaneous melanoma um, that was resected five years previously. Uh, presented with metastases to the bladder in August of 2012, uh, also involving the urethra, lung, perinephric mass, uh, got a PD-1 inhibitor, and it was administered every three weeks. Um, by week eight, she was having some symptoms uh, with difficulty voiding, but the renal function stayed stable, so she continued on treatment. But by week 10, she was responding. You can see here that this pulmonary nodule started shrinking and the scan showed almost a, cleat, uh, a near complete uh, response. Again, those people typically have a durable response. 
continued treatment for another 11 months. And then come August of 2013, she developed some shortness of breath and had some worsening infiltrates bilaterally, especially towards the mid to lower lung bases. Fortunately, this was a unrecognized phenomenon by the time this patient uh, developed these things. And she was started on methylprednisolone. The doses are relatively high, actually, a milligram per kilogram, BID, um, uh, for up to four days. And then they get transferred to prednisone if they notice some improvement. The taper of these corticosteroids usually occurs over uh, a four to six week period. So, you know, um, I have had some people where uh, if we taper too quickly, it flares up. A lot of these patients are keen to get back on their treatment, but we hold their treatment until uh, their symptoms are at least grade one to, to normal. And I'll get into the grading system later. And this next slide just shows resolution. It took over four months for this patient's infiltrates to start improving. And, uh, you know, she actually, because she had a complete response, and we know those patients can have very durable responses, even off treatment, she was stopped off treatment and, uh, you know, uh, no, no evidence of progression of her disease. So I'll just get into the grading system. You know, you guys don't really need to know about this grading system because this grading system is actually for clinical trials in uh, cancer treatments. And it's based off this CTCAE, which is the Clinical Trials um, Committee Adverse Event Reporting uh, from the NCI. So essentially, as you go higher up in grade, it just increases in severity of your symptoms. So grade one would mean that you don't have any symptoms of pneumonitis. You just got a random chest x-ray and it showed that there was some, maybe some infiltrates there or a CT scan that showed infiltrates, but you're not hypoxic, you're not short of breath, you have no cough, for instance. Grade two is that you have some mild cough, but you don't require oxygen, for instance. And then if this is prolonged, we do actually delay IO treatment and actually consider um, dosing the methylprednisolone, but this usually occurs as an outpatient. Um, sometimes we do bring patients in if it's, if, if they're not responding to their corticosteroids, but usually by the time that people present to the emergency department, they're grade three or four, where they're having severe new symptoms and, and the symptoms occurred very quickly. They have um, hypoxia and they're short of breath at rest. These patients come to your emergency department and it's important to identify that uh, one, that they're on immune checkpoint inhibitor for their cancer, and two, that there is a possibility that this could be pneumonitis as opposed to an infectious um, uh, etiology. Definitely, you should work them up for the etiology. You should be getting them COVID uh, testing and, and flu testing and uh, blood cultures and such, uh, and then scans. But definitely on the top of your mind, you have to think that this is maybe an immune checkpoint inhibitor complication. Um, so we would have to, if it was severe enough, grade three or four, uh, we hospitalize the patient. Again, we give high doses of methylprednisolone. And then we oftentimes will have to uh, empirically treat them with antibiotics for opportunistic infections. And you consider bronchoscopy and lung biopsy if, uh, if um, uh, they're not improving. Uh, we usually taper over a six week period, as I said. And if they're not improving, we sometimes give adjuncts to the corticosteroids, such as infliximab, cyclophosphamide. We also have given IVIG and MMF or mycophenolate as another adjunct to try and calm the immune system down. Now, the pulmonary toxicity, you know, as I said, uh, these are clinical trial reported incidences. So to tell you the truth, I think that these are underreported. I think the frequency is actually a little bit higher than these, um, actually for all the toxicities that I'm going to be presenting. But these are what's reported in clinical trials. It's reported as high as 10 percent um, uh, in clinical trials. The duration of treatment prior to the development of the pneumonitis was variable, but it typically occurred around the three-month range, but as early as the first dose in nine, in nine days. And then this is maybe uh, comments to one of the questions that we had. Only half a percent that developed the pneumonitis actually die from it. So it's reassuring that it is uh, recoverable. Now, special considerations in terms of COVID-19, it can be extremely difficult to discern a patient with pneumonitis versus COVID-19, but definitely if someone comes in with uh, respiratory symptoms, I'm almost certain that everyone will be on in full PPE and there will be COVID-19 testing. Um, it definitely adds to the complexity of, uh, of patients with cancer care. 
Uh, pneumonitis may mimic the COVID-19, as I just said. It also may delay the initiation of gluco glucocorticosteroids, given that it's oftentimes cautioned in, it, uh, in mild to moderate COVID-19. To tell you the truth, I don't think that this will be much of an issue in the emergency department um, in light of the fact that most patients are moderate to severe when they present to the emergency department with this pneumonitis. And then again, there's conflicting data regarding whether IO therapy affects the severity of COVID-19. A lot of patients ask, oh, can if I'm on IO treatment, can I get the vaccine? Our hospital um, practice uh, and uh, um, uh, operating procedure is that we are allowed to get the COVID-19 vaccine regardless of the immune checkpoint inhibitor that you're on, even with the doublet immune checkpoint inhibitor. And there have been studies of flu with immune checkpoint inhibitors, and there doesn't seem to be any um, increased severity in patients that develop flu while on immune checkpoint inhibitors, and there isn't any uh, data on um, whether they're protected, uh, but it doesn't seem like the incidence of flu is higher in patients on immune checkpoint inhibitors. So, you know, um, uh, definitely we are encouraging our patients to uh, get vaccinated for COVID-19, and uh, again, you know, definitely patients that present with these uh, respiratory symptoms need COVID-19 testing. I guess the question is, is there any way to discern um, whether someone is COVID-19 versus uh, pneumonitis right off the bat? You know, I, I suspect it would be related to other symptoms. If you've had rhinorrhea or um, a sore throat, uh, typically uh, that does not coincide with immune checkpoint inhibitors. So that would be something maybe on clinical history that could discern this. But, you know, I have seen some people develop sinusitis. So, you know, it can be very difficult to discern between the two. Moving on to some GI-related toxicities. Again, you know, it's important to recognize the colitis and the diarrhea. This is a 64-year-old gentleman, again, melanoma, three cycles of combined immune checkpoint inhibitor with ipilimumab, nivolumab, developed what we would grade as grade three toxicity of diarrhea. Um, and with associated abdominal discomfort and bloating. He was admitted for IV methylprednisolone, one to two milligrams per kilogram. He didn't have improvement over 48 hours and we had to give him infliximab, which is a TNF alpha inhibitor. They oftentimes use this in rheumatoid arthritis to calm down inflamed joints. So we use it in this setting as well. The diarrhea ultimately improved. And then again, he had to be discharged home over a tapering dose of prednisone over a six week period. So a happy, happy outcome. Again, looking at this clinical trial grading, this is again, probably not something that uh, you would uh, for early grade one um, or grade two, you would see because typically grade one is less than four stools over their baseline. Uh, again, diarrheal or, or watery stools over their baseline. Um, grade two is uh, four to six stools uh, over their baseline. And sometimes with people with uh, grade two diarrhea that prolong is prolonged over, uh, over a week, again, they will come into the eMERGE saying that, you know, they're, they're just dehydrated, they're feeling unwell. And again, in the context of prolonged grade two diarrhea, we do admit these patients for IV steroids. And it's the same uh, dosing regimen, a milligram per kilogram per day of methylprednisolone. Again, it requires an infectious workup and we oftentimes involve our GI colleagues and also, um, uh, you know, a, a, a C. difficile and things like that and, and a stool CNS to rule out infection. We got another question here, a quick question. Yeah. Um, in general, is it safer uh, to cover a suspected ionomonitis with antibiotic or uh, do we know if benefits outweigh the risks, et cetera, C. diff? Yeah, you know, uh, if someone is unstable, or for instance, or uh, they, you know, their their vitals are, are their their blood pressure is low, or for instance, they're requiring oxygen, I don't think it's wrong to put them on antibiotics. There actually is retrospective um, looks at patients that go on antibiotics for a variety of reasons while they're on immune therapy. Some people say that if it changes your microbiome, which is basically you, the type of bacteria that your body harvests. Um, or, or it is within your body, like for instance, in your stool, that can affect your response to immune therapy. But in the context of someone that's unwell, I think that using antibiotics to cover them for an infection is the right thing to do. As long as uh, once those cultures come back, we discontinue. Or for instance, if, 
if we do find an infectious etiology, then we cut back on the corticosteroids, for instance. So having said that, I have seen someone with immune-related colitis and C. difficile at the same time. So again, you know, it can be a bit difficult to discern, but uh, I don't think it's wrong to use antibiotics. And it says that actually here for grade three or four toxicity. So again, this is a type of doctor the toxicity you'll see in the eMERGE greater than seven stools per day. You know, they'll require IV fluids and they'll have abdominal discomfort. You'll be getting scans. And, you know, grade four is actually where we worry about life-threatening perforation. It says here, high dose IV um, methylprednisolone with your prophylactic antibiotics for opportunistic infections. And again, if I don't see improvement within three to five days, I'm putting them on a strong TNF-alpha inhibitor. Again, uh, another strong immunosuppressant medication. Okay, we have another question. How long are patients typically on immune checkpoint inhibitors? Yeah, so good question. So um, in all the trials, typically is for the metastatic setting, they're on immune checkpoint inhibitors for up to two years. Um, in the adjuvant setting, it's about a year. And to tell you the truth, those are chosen arbitrarily in terms of that's how the clinical trials were designed. But I have seen patients where they get two doses of treatment. Uh, they have a great response, but they had toxicity from it and we stopped treatment. And they've been off treatment for years and their, their cancer has not returned, even though I've been scanning them regularly. So the optimal duration of treatment, especially given some of these toxicities, we don't know. There are studies looking at that. Actually, there's a Canadian study um, looking at uh, um, whether we can stop early on treatment. But you know, um, uh, at, I try and get patients through at least a year's worth of treatment. If they're having difficulty with toxicity, we have a low uh, threshold to abandon, especially if they develop this complete response or even a partial response if they're having some tough toxicities. Yeah, that's great. Another quick one, and then we can move on. Um, is there a certain point during the therapy that patients are more at higher risk for um, these uh, adverse events? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, um, there actually is a publication in, in the Journal of Clinical Oncology that looks at the timing of this. Although any of these complications can occur with the first dose, not only that, they can occur even uh, you know, four to six months off treatment, and I suspect because the drug is still within the, their system. Um, but usually the vast majority of these occur within the first three months of treatment. But again, they can occur later um, and earlier. Uh, but uh, for instance, the colitis, usually the onset is within the first three months. Uh, just back to the diarrhea and colitis, it's quite common. 44% of patients will develop ip, uh, ipilimumab and nivolumab induced colitis or, or diarrhea. The perforation risk is less than 2%. So that's something to know. And, you know, in the initial trial, it was around 2%, but on subsequent trials, that perforation risk dropped. And I think it's partly because people recognize that it's important to uh, educate our patients and our colleagues about this complication. And so I think we're managing it a lot better. So the perforation risk has dropped dramatically. Um, in refractory cases, in refractory cases, infliximab, MM, MMF, and vendolizumab have been used. Now this brings us to uh, the endocrine uh, immune-related adverse events. Uh, again, uh, the interesting thing about these ones is that they're usually irreversible. So uh, you can see a variety of endocrinopathies, hypophysitis, hypo and hyperthyroid. So again, some patients can present with um, tachycardia or even um, uh, hyperthyroid-induced AFib, so something to watch out for. Primary and secondary adrenal insufficiency, these patients typically present with profound fatigue, nausea, and vomiting. And, you know, it's important to get a, a cortisol. And if their cortisol is below 200, we have to suspect this adrenal insufficiency. And again, they can present with hypotension and electrolyte disturbances as well. So very important to uh, identify. And then although uh, type 1 diabetes is quite rare, I put it to, I added this in part because they can present with DKA and it can be life-threatening. And I have two cases of endocrinopathies I'll present right now. So the first case is of a hypophysitis, a 55-year-old uh, male with stage four melanoma, uh, started on nivolumab after progressing on targeted treatment, got six cycles, and he essentially presented with headache, nausea, vomiting, profound fatigue, just like I said, 
and he had a really profoundly low cortisol below a hundred. And, uh, you know, he was started on 60 milligrams of prednisone and these patients actually have a Lazarus effect. Once you put them on corticosteroid, uh, even a basal level, um, sometimes I just put them on, uh, a uh, Cortef uh, or hydrocortisone at 10 milligrams BID, within hours of taking that, they feel back to normal. The important thing about this is that you have to inform them that they have to be uh, receiving stress steroids in the context of infection, trauma, or surgery. So sometimes we have to get medic alert bracelets for these patients. Now, in terms of this hypophysitis, this patient actually, uh, this was his MRI baseline, and you can see that there's actually inflammation of his pituitary gland. So an interesting finding, and uh, this patient actually developed secondary adrenal insufficiency from his immune checkpoint inhibitor. The incidence is quite rare, and again, although I tell you that it's quite rare, I actually have seen this more frequently than this incidence. So I think that this is underreported. Uh, high... Uh, high dose versus basal requirements of corticosteroid. I usually put people on just basal levels of cort Cortef at 10 milligrams BID, and they make this Lazarus effect. And typically they don't present to the eMERGE in part because I add a cortisol with every treatment. Oftentimes it, it can happen suddenly. You know, patients call in, they, call, they say that they have headaches and they're really tired. I warn them about this toxicity. And then once I get them on Cortef, they don't end up in the eMERGE and, and, and they feel markedly better. But the key is to educate them about the side effect and then also tell them about stress dosing in the context of infection, trauma, uh, surgery, just like I told you. This is a patient with uh, another endocrinopathy uh, presented with DKA, metastatic melanoma, history of coxoides, mycoses in the past, hypothyroidism, GERD, again, got dual agent immune checkpoint inhibitor. And... After the second cycle of treatment, so very early on, this is week um, six, he developed shortness of breath, polydipsia, polyuria, nausea and vomiting. He had episodes of diarrhea, but it was only grade one level, so less than four episodes uh, above his baseline. Denied any fever, chills, rigors, no chest discomfort or cough or hemoptysis. And you can see here that he had marked uh, alterations to his electrolytes, his potassium was fairly high. He was in uh, acute renal failure and his uh, random glucose was uh, quite high and he had an anion gap. So essentially this was consistent with DKA and it was treated exactly as uh, DKA and the MERCH um, uh, treated them very appropriately. They got endocrinology and it was admitted very urgently. Interesting thing is that the endocrinologist actually requested this anti-GAD65, which is actually an antibody that looks at um, uh, attack of your beta islet cells, and it came back positive. So I wonder whether the drug actually elicited this anti antibody me or anti uh, uh, immune response towards the beta islet cells of his pancreas, and that's why he became type one diabetic. The patient it was restarted on nivolumab treatment, and he completed the two year course. After that, he developed a complete response, and he's alive five years out from his treatment. So again, an amazing response, but a very terrible toxicity that you know, was life-threatening. Nivolumab, we did, uh, sorry, he actually didn't complete. He actually uh, continued with nivolumab, but we abandoned a bit early because he developed further toxicities with arthritis and the hypophysitis. But five years out later, he's still alive. So amazing response. So DKA is quite rare. They report at 1%. To tell you the truth, again, I think underreported. I, uh, uh, between me and my colleague, we've seen four cases. Uh, uh, it, in our uh, population. So again, uh, I think underreported, it can be life-threatening as 70% of people will present with DKA, typically develops within the first three months of treatment. More frequent with, is, we think that it's due to the PD-1 inhibitor or PD-L1 inhibitor than the CTLA-4 inhibitor. And half the cases had detectable type one diabetes associated antibodies, just like my patient. Now, this brings me to the last case. We're just going to quickly talk about neurological and cardiac immune-related adverse events. This is a 72-year-old male with um, metastatic melanoma resected from the lung. So he had no evidence of disease. And we put him on adjuvant treatment of, um, with a PD-1 inhibitor. Interesting thing is that he actually had a thymoma that was resected. And he, he had hypertension, dyslipidemia. We put him on adjuvant treatment. So it, since the adjuvant treatment is to, uh, we know that by giving treatment after you've had your melanoma resected, that it can reduce your risk of recurrence. 
And essentially with his first dose, he developed a two-day history of horizontal diplopia and dis dizziness, no chest pain, no nausea, no vomiting whatsoever, no exposure to COVID-19, and a screening test was negative. He was admitted because his CK was markedly up. And, uh, you know, we worry about myositis. And the eMERGE doc did the right thing. They added troponin because his CK was up, and it was at 868 despite not having any uh, cardiac uh, symptoms. The ECG was normal. A, a day into his admission, he had an acute deterioration in terms of his respiratory status. He was transferred to the CCU. His echo showed normal heart LV and RV function. He had slow vital capacities were observed. And so uh, the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis was entertained. He was put on BiPAP um, uh, for respiratory fatigue, fatigability and positional decompensations in respiratory status. He received five rounds of IVIG. He got pulse doses of steroid, which is a gram of methylprednisolone. He got mes mestinon and also methotrexate. So they basically threw the kitchen sink at this gentleman. Um, a muscle biopsy of his deltoid showed myositis and also showed immune-mediated necro necrotizing myopathy. So evidence of a myositis as well. Seven rounds of Plex completed in the ICU. He was ultimately transferred to neurology once he stabilized. He deteriorated again, unfortunately, because he had a run of AFib, probably from the myositis that he had developed, readmitted to the ICU, ultimately recovered, and is now on a tapering dose of prednisone and methotrexate as an outpatient. So fortunately, he recovered. And again, you know, um, uh, a very terrible toxicity related to this. So, you know, the neurological toxicities are less than 5%. Uh, but what this teaches you is that 50% of patients can present with concomitant immune-related adverse events affecting other organs. So whenever I see someone, as I mentioned to you earlier, with uh, myositis or even a neurological complication associated with immune checkpoint inhibitors, I always draw a troponin, even in the absence of uh, cardiac symptoms. And the other thing to note is that any component of the nervous system can be affected. So from the um, muscles to the um, uh, nerve muscle uh, uh, transition. And uh, I've seen uh, my, um, um, myoradiculopathy. I've seen the myasthenia gravis. I've seen the Guillain-Barre. And as I mentioned, my colleague has seen the cerebritis and encephalitis. So, you know, a variety of neurological complications. I, I do find it very strange that neurological and cardiac toxicities occur together. But, you know, again, uh, something just to note is something to to look for. If you have so someone with one toxicity, it's important to look for other toxicities. And just to summarize now, these are my last few slides, keys to managing immune-related adverse events. Most of these immune-related adverse events are manageable or with early recognition and treatment with high-dose corticosteroids. Severe toxicities may require pulse dosing of steroids, and that's a gram of, of a corticosteroid. So if anyone had um, severe pulmonary toxicity, or we pulsed patients with re really severe hepatitis where they were unstable, and um, even the cardiac toxicity, we would consider pulse dosing of steroids. For refractory or prolonged immune-related adverse events, uh, again, we uh, use uh, corticosteroid um, sparing agents like TNF-alpha inhibitors, rituximab, MMF, imuran, cyclosporin, methotrexate, and uh, as you've seen, Plex and IVIG. A slow taper of corticosteroids of at least four weeks is required and even longer. I've had patients on steroids for months. We try and keep the, the uh, we try and taper people as quickly as possible, but not quicker than four weeks typically, in part because we, won't, we don't want to counteract their immune system in terms of attacking the cancer, but we also don't want their toxicities to flare up. So to conclude, Optimal management of immune-related adverse events involve a multidisciplinary team. And so I really appreciate CAEP to invite me to give this talk. Remain, we, we must remain vigilant throughout and even after treatment, as I've seen, uh, patients can develop these toxicities about four to six months out after their treatment. Many patients develop multiple immune-related adverse events. So it's important to uh, look out for other toxicities um, when someone has developed one toxicity. And it's important to educate our colleagues and also our patients to monitor for, and report these symptoms. So with that, I'd like to conclude. And again, thank you for uh, your patience and your, uh, your uh, 
um, uh, your attention. Amazing. Thank you, Dr. Mazon, uh, for the phenomenal talk. Um, we have a few minutes here, and there's actually a couple of questions if you want to go through them here. Um, the first one says, um, is it all of the IO treated cancers and all the IOs carry the whole range of adverse events, or do some combos predispose to certain complications? Are yeah. patients usually provided with info uh, for the ED? Yes, absolutely. So, um, yes, some toxicities are worse. For instance, with the CTLA-4 inhibitors, um, there's more risk of diarrhea and perforation, while with the PD-1 inhibitors, they, less, they have less colitis and less risk of per perforation. In general, PD-1 inhibitors are better tolerated than CTLA-4 inhibitors, and there does seem to be synergy between the combination when you combine CTLA-4 and PD-1 inhibitors, as there is uh, more toxicity than you would see by itself. So definitely there is uh, unique toxicities uh, with each of the agents. I mentioned the DKA and type one diabetes uh, oftentimes can, um, can um, uh, be associated with the PD-1 inhibitors and less so with the CTLA-4 inhibitors. So definitely um, uh, different toxicities for different immune checkpoint inhibitors. But it's important to know that they can happen regardless, and it's important to identify these uh, your pa your patients that are on immune checkpoint inhibitors versus targeted treatments or alternatively chemo. And sometimes that can be difficult. You know, it's a whole new uh, medical dictionary that we need to learn in terms of the names of these drugs. Okay, there's a there's a few more questions here. Let's try to get through them. Uh, Shannon asks, survival increased when these agents uh, for these agents, but but can you comment on the quality of life of the patients? Are these extra months or years or just quantity? Yeah, so it's a great point. Um, the vast majority of people that tolerate these treatments um, and, or even have one of these toxicities, as I mentioned, are typically reversible. And so I think their quality of life uh, is quite good, actually, although um, I, I, I'm almost positive that there's data that suggests that their quality of life um, is good, but uh, I don't think that there's any studies looking at long-term survivorship. And actually, I think that's a great point. So for instance, people that end up with the endocrinopathies um, where they're on hormone replacement forever, um, they do have some symptoms related to these endocrinopathies that they have to live with. But as I said, uh, I have patients where they've developed, like for instance, the hepatitis or the colitis, and they got two doses of treatment. We treated their colitis, but it was so severe that we were forced to stop their treatment. And they've recovered completely from that and they're back to their baseline and alive without signs of their cancer years out from treatment and off treatment. So I'm almost certain that there is improvement in quality of life or uh, at least a maintenance in quality of life with these treatments. Okay, great. And there's, uh, let's just do one more here. There's um, another question from Mike. Um, and Mike asks, how long after uh, DC of the IO therapy can the patients present with side effects and toxicities? Is yeah. I think um, I think if we were to stop treatment to work where I would feel comfortable that they would be out of the window of toxicity, I think four to six months. We didn't, actually don't know how quickly these drugs are actually cleared in our system. They're cleared not by the typical uh, pharmacokinetics uh, with our kidneys or our liver. It actually is cleared by our reticuloendothelial system because they're antibodies. And um, we, if they were to follow first order kinetics, we would expect them to be cleared within four to six months, but we actually don't know. But I, you know, I, I do worry, uh, only within that four to six month window after six months, I think it would be very unlikely to develop an immune related toxicity. Okay. And actually, you know, one, one last thing, cause there's a couple of similar questions here. What, what do we have as emerge doctors or what, what are patients given that maybe like an alert card or something that would trigger us, you know, to know that they're on, you know, these type of therapies, these kind of medicate these drugs. Yeah, you know, we actually give these patients handouts on these drugs and exactly these toxicities, uh, especially the ones that are severe enough that would pre cause presentation to the eMERGE. So they get their own paperwork to, to, to bring to the emergency department. We actually were also giving them a card that said, hey, I'm on immune therapy and uh, you know, there was actually a pharma company that um, uh, put a link to uh, the investigator brochure so that uh, physicians could actually um, 
uh, review the potential toxicities related to these treatments. And, you know, um, I'm always uh, happy to hear from patients when I'm on call, or sorry, patients, the physicians when I'm on call, it, it, just to discern whether uh, um, these are immune-related toxicities that require admission to our service or, 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 or to another service to, uh, if, it, if it is not. So, you know, uh, definitely uh, the key is to reach out to the oncologist on call as well. Okay, and I want to squeeze in Jen's last, last question, I promise. Could you comment on patient's prognosis in the case of suspected cerebritis? Yeah, you know, unfortunately, um, I did not have uh, this case, but um, I do think that, that my colleague's case, it was fatal. Um, that patient was admitted, and despite the corticosteroids and the, um, the uh, uh, other uh, TNF-alpha inhibitors that were tried, Unfortunately, I think the patient passed away. And um, the thing is, is that they were, I think, debating between cerebritis or encephal uh, encephalitis versus um, leptomeningeal or microscopic involvement of the brain of their cancer. So it's sometimes hard to discern progression of disease versus, uh, but I do think that uh, it pretends a very poor prognosis. Um, unfortunately, I have yet to see it, but my colleague has, unfortunately. All right. Well, on that, uh, on that note, even though, you know, we don't want to end on a sad note, um, we're just about out of time. I'd like to thank Dr. Manzon for this very informative talk and provide, uh, provided us with the pearls and tips for our next encounter with these patients. Um, special thanks to Scientific Planning Committee for their input and, of course, the amazing CAPE staff for all their work and guidance to help us put this webinar on. Um, just a reminder that the session has been accredited by the College of Family Physicians of Canada and the Royal College. Please don't forget to complete the evaluation form and claim your credits. A certificate of attendance will be mailed out uh, by CAPE together with an evaluation link. Uh, finally, CAPE has, as you can see, a very interesting lineup of live and on-demand educational webinars planned over the next few months. So keep an eye out uh, for the information and we hope that you'll be joining us again soon. Stay safe and thanks everyone for being participating in this webinar. Thanks everyone.